You're tuned in to the Dakota Housing Network on Super Talk 1270 and supertalk1270.com. In-depth discussion and analysis of real estate issues nationwide and those issues unique to our area. Our team of experts includes Joe Sheehan, Greg Larson, Dave Floor, Brian Ritter, and a great variety of guests. The Dakota Housing Network begins now on Super Talk 1270 and supertalk1270.com. All right. Good morning, everybody. Jim, I'm so glad I'm deemed an expert. Oh, on the okay. intro, it says yeah. our panel are experts, and I'm I'm in that group. I'm pretty excited. Oh, you're the smart guy today. Yeah. Usually, yeah. it's what two dumb guys two dumb asking guys. Uh, questions of a smart guy. Right? Yeah. No, I'm. Well, it's who sang that song? Just the two of us. Just the two. With Bill that Withers? was Bill Withers with Grover Washington on the saxophone. On the sax. So it's just the two of us this morning. Just the two of us. Dave Floor and Jim Walsh. Uh, we're, we're just the two of us this morning Yeah, on the Dakota housing network. Joe's um, away on some personal business. Yes. Uh, there, we want to, uh, extend our condolences to yeah. the Miles Graydon, uh, family. Yeah. Miles is a longtime realtor in uh, the Bismarck Mandan area. He passed away this so past Joe's week. So Joe's away basically saying goodbye yeah. to his friend. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, but our condolences is out to the Absolutely. Miles, his family and his coworkers and everything at uh, Century 21. So. All right. Uh, what are we? Well, we always start out with the mortgage rates. So let's do that. Huh? The Freddie Mac survey. Does that sound like a plan? Freddie, Freddie, right. Freddie. oh, Freddie Mac. Is that a song? No. No. Okay. That's Jimmy Mac. That's Jimmy you Mac. You were doing Jimmy Mac. Martha and the Mac. VDs. We should do that. We should. Have, we could have an intro for the Freddie Mac survey yeah, every week. Okay. You, we could throw Jimmy Mac on there. Well, I don't think Martha Reeves is doing much these days. Maybe we can get her to cut it. It maybe, which yeah. is too bad because she was a great singer. Well, we could use Jimmy Mac. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyway, the Freddie Mac Mortgage Market Survey for the week of April thirtieth, which is today. Thirty-year uh, fixed rate mortgage averaged three point six eight percent, with an average of six point or zero point six point for the week ending. Uh, last week, uh, it averaged 3.65, so we're up three basis points, Jim. Oh, my gosh. Um, a year ago, the 30-year f- mortgage was averaged 4.29, so we are well below that. Uh, the 15-year f- fixed-rate mortgage was at 2.94%. That was up from last week when it was at 2.92. Oh, boy. And last year, the 15-year was at 3.38%. So, folks, the rates are still good, even though they've taken a little hit the last two days. I would say, you know, the Freddie Mac survey is a little bit uh, behind the times by a couple days. Uh, the last couple days, it's taken a little bit of a, a hit on the rates, but yeah. not too much of a change. So I would certainly uh, float or lock, depending upon what your circumstances are. I don't think you're going to get hurt too bad, so... All right. Uh, what else do we say about the economy uh, from uh, the MBS Highway? Uh, Bear, our friend Barry Habib. Uh, yesterday, the Fed uh, released their statement uh, from their last meeting. Uh, they, oh, Jim, they removed all calendar references for hiking rates. What? They they didn't all put a date calendar. in there that that, oh. that we're going to hike them in 2015 or, oh. or do it in June or. September. Are they, they going to tell us to take a hike? Out. They took their t- t- maybe they are. I don't know. Oh. It could be a subtle message to us. Uh, but they're the Fed's going to be completely data driven on when they uh, hike rates. So they are looking at uh, inflation uh, moving towards their two percent target, and they want to see uh, job gains. So regardless of the date. They're going to just basically hike it when they feel like they need to hike it. Right. They're not looking at, hey, this will probably happen in June or September or something. They're just going to look at what's the data tell us. Yeah. Now, uh, I think they probably feel fairly comfortable that they'll be hiking rates. Well, they're going to look at it on like a day by day or week by week basis. Oh, they look at it daily, but. Yeah, I would think. Yeah. You know, know, they want to know where it's going, uh, what the trend, what the trend is, you know. Yeah. You're going to have the daily fluctuations, but they're looking for, is there a trend up? on inflation. So instance. how do they used to do it? Did they just wait until it set aside a certain day and then on that certain day they decide what well, to do? Well, you know, they have these meetings and then they come out with their statement afterwards. Right. And they do a press conference and all this stuff yeah. after their meetings. And, you know, for the last few years now, they, you know, it's been, well, we're not going to hike rates, but now, you know, the economy's maybe improved a little bit. So they're looking yeah. at it. Well, we'll probably hike rates in the first quarter of 2015 was what it was for a while. Then it was, well, maybe in June of 2015. So now they've just removed that date thing and they don't want to be tied 
I guess they're saying yeah. they don't want to be tied to a date or a time frame. It'll when change when it changes. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. Um, so I think everybody's expecting that they probably will be doing something this year sometime. Yeah. Uh, but I would not be su- surprised if they didn't raise the rates. Uh, and we're talking about one rate, the overnight rate that they they charge or okay. pay the banks to deposit their money there. This does have an effect on mortgage rates. Um, but I would not be surprised if they don't if they don't change anything this year and they keep them at basically you know a quarter percent or whatever it is um, and don't make any changes until next year. Mm. It wouldn't be surprising. Um, other news uh, along that line: initial jobless claims for this week uh, or for the week ending uh, April twenty fifth were reported at two hundred sixty two thousand. That was much better than expected and represented a, de- a decrease of 34000 from the prior week's figure. This That was the lowest claims figure in 15 years. So that's good news. Yeah. Kind of, maybe. Kind of, sort of. That can also mean well, there, there be- were some people not looking for jobs anymore. They dropped out of the job market. There has been a lot of conflicting information coming out about just how well we're doing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, basically, no matter where you stand politically, there's something out there that will back up. You know, if you yeah. if you don't like the guy in the White House, you could say, "Well, the economy's down because of this," or if you like him, yeah. "Well, the economy's up because of this." Yeah, well, exactly. You you can take numbers and and make them fit what your scenario oh, yeah. wants to be. The devil uh, can political. cite scripture to suit his own purpose. There you go, Shakespeare. There you go. Bill Bill knew what he's talking about. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway. They, uh, you know, Barry continues, uh, personal income and spending were, loose, were released. They were a bit lower than expectations. Income was flat. Uh, so really not a lot of changes in yeah. the last week or month. Um, but what the Fed is going to be looking for uh, on, to raise our rates is inflation trending up towards 2% and plurality employment numbers getting better. Okay. okay. All right. What else we got? Uh, oh, our kind of a potpourri here of information uh, a potpourri in our first segment uh, from <laughs> our friend elliot eisenberg the bow tie economist yeah uh jim did you know that a dollar of government spending can create more than a dollar of tax revenue uh, a dollar of government spending can create more than a dollar of tax revenue yes. about 60 billion dollars hmm. a year of medicare spending goes for improper payments with a return of over ten dollars for each dollar spent, Congress should increase the Medicare fraud busting budget. Okay. Similarly, with a return of about five dollars for each dollar spent, Congress should increase the IRS audit budget and chip away at the five hundred forty billion in annual unpaid taxes. So Elliot is saying that if the government, you know, they're cutting back on the, the say the IRS budget, right, and and the number of auditors. Well, guess what. Elliot's saying that if you actually spent money on there, you'd collect more taxes. Interesting. If you would put a little more money into it, uh, so that's a you know interesting take that you discourage people from committing fraud or ignoring you. You, you might get you some spend back. money and get yeah. more back. How very ungovernment like of them. Yeah, no kidding. All right. Well, we'll be back on the Dakota Housing Network, going out on Mr. Steve Miller, who will be in Bismarck. This month, just a few days or next away. month, actually, yeah. technically, in uh, about three weeks from now. Yeah. yeah. Right now, it's 64. Get the app called Radio Pup for your iPhone and take us everywhere you go. Bismarck and Mandan's own Super Talk, 1270. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Miller. Some Steve call Miller. him the Space Cowboy. Yes. Some the Joker. call him the Gangster of Love. The Joker. Living in the U.S. of A. All right. Dave Floor, Jim Walsh here on the Dakota Housing Network. Uh, Jim? Yeah. Do you know this? This is, again, from Elliot Eisenberg's uh, Econ Econ 70 blog at econ70.com if you'd want to sign up for it. I'll do tell. Elliot gave us a little, this is from his last Friday file, he calls it. it. Just a little tidbit for the day, a little trivia question, a little bar bet maybe. Okay. A little vignette, as it were. Contrary to popular wisdom and after controlling for socioeconomic status, persons that eat, eat an apple a day are just as likely to see the doctor or have an overnight hospital stay as those that do not. Okay. Despite this heavy blow to the fruit farmer industrial complex, the research did show that daily apple eaters used slightly fewer prescription drugs, suggesting that an apple oh. a day keeps the pharmacist away. 
Well. So we've kind of morphed. We, it's not the doctor. It's the pharmacist that we can keep away if we eat an apple a day. Keep right. from the door, okay. yes. All right. So that's our uh, little bar bet trivia thing for the day. That I like apples in the fall. I like, yeah. Oh, that, well. Red, delicious apples. That's when we get them the best here. Yeah. Yeah. Apples are good for you, folks. So feel free to eat them and keep pharmacists away. I got a trivia question for okay. you. Okay, all right. Uh, on the old Beatle albums where they had the apple label. Yes. What kind of apple was it? Oh, it was a Golden Delicious. Granny Smith. Granny Smith. Okay. Granny Smith. I, know it was, I know it was green. Yeah, it was a green one. Yeah. Okay. Not a crab apple either. No, not a crab apple. Oh, great. Jim. Yes. I have a question for you. Fire away. Do Hit two, me with your best shot. Okay, this... Do two half victims make a whole case? Uh, eh? Do two half victims make a whole case? This is regarding lawsuits. Well, I, think? I think being a victim is like being pregnant. You either are or you aren't. So you can't really be a half a victim. Uh, I don't see how. I okay. mean, if you're ripped off, uh, you're ripped off. You know? Okay. All right. Well, last week we talked about um, where Quicken is suing uh, the – Quicken Loans is suing – the uh, Department of Justice and Federal uh, Federal Housing Administration, FHA. Yeah, um, you're going to refresh saying, our memories on that, right? Yeah, good. They're uh, they're they're suing them because they're saying they're they've cost them. You know, they've been doing a three year investigation, and and they think they're they're asking Quicken to settle this lawsuit, and Quicken doesn't agree with it, so they're they're suing the government back. And now, and okay. then last week or this past week, it came out that now. FHA and the DOJ are going to sue Quicken, okay? Because they're right. saying they violated things. Well, anyway, th- this uh, this article was in the Wall Street Journal. It kind of ties to this about um, banks paying for allegedly discriminated against fractions of humans. Fractions of humans. Um, this is welcome to the new frontier of progressive law enforcement, and this affects us. Uh, whether we're buying a, a house, um, as we talked about with Quicken Loans, and that can apply to a community bank here in North Dakota, possibly. Well, during the Civil War, slaves were considered three-fifths of a person. Yeah. Okay. Now, this, this article in a Wall Street Journal is about actually uh, car loans. Uh, but it's, it's they, they're calling it, Welcome to the New Frontier of Progressive Law Enforcement, Ex- Extorting Damage Awards from Businesses Without Naming Anyone Who's Been Damaged. Okay. Okay. More than a year ago, Ally Bank paid $80 million to allegedly abused borrowers uh, in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB, which Joe and I have talked about many times on this show, uh, still has not distributed a nickel to any alleged victims. Okay. okay. Uh, is it possible victims aren't getting paid because there are no victims? Oh. Okay. That'd be a hell of a class action suit. And the article goes on to say no this class. from the Wall Street Journal. Yep. Recently, we told you about the bizarre federal campaign against auto lenders in which bureaucrats guessed the ethnicity of borrowers based on their last names and addresses. Yeah. The feds then claimed discrimination in interest rates if the people they assume are minorities on average pay more than yeah. on average pay more than similar borrowers that the Fed assume are white. This is not a joke. This is how they're doing this. Yeah. Okay. So they look if your name if your last name was Sanchez. Yeah. But you were but you were or, you were totally Caucasian, and that's yeah. how it's how you mark yourself on a tax return, et cetera. But because of your last name, they would assume you were a minority. Yeah, or if they were running horse or whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Um, now, by law, auto dealers who offer financing car buyers are not allowed to record a borrower's race. Now, on a well, mortgage yeah, that, that on a mortgage sense. application, the question is there, and you ask a person, you know, are you white? Okay, you know. Indian, black, whatever, but people don't have to answer the question. Right. But I think, and a lender can call in and tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I think they're, they also ask the lender then to make an observation and mark down whether this person is a, whether they think it's a rate, they're a certain race. Okay. All right. Uh, so, but the auto dealers can't put anything down. They're by law, they cannot. So, the government's going after the auto dealers saying, well, we assume that these people are all minorities and they paid a higher interest rate than any other person. But without looking oh. at it, without looking at it, why, they're just assuming that because that's a person is a minority. Why, so, they, they just didn't want to bother checking the guy's uh, credit record? Yeah. So what they what the government has done imagine these is that difficult. car dealers, they assign probabilities for the race of borrowers based on their names and where they live. Yeah. Okay. It's. 
and it says it's good enough for government work, but what if one day the government has to identify the victims, verify they really that they really are members of minority groups, and confirm that they suffered discrimination? That'd be quite the undertaking. I wonder it? if it works the other way. If your name is like Josiah Ellington Dupont the Fourth, do they assume you're better than everybody else? They would assume you're white and rich. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or if your last name happens to be uh, Rockefeller, Rockefeller, or, Rockefeller. Yeah. You know. Why? Yeah. Or Gates? Would or they Trump? assume? Or yeah. Buffett? Yeah. <laughs> they assume you're related to Bill or Warren. I don't right. know. You know. Um, so anyway, the Ally Bank forked over eighty million dollars in damage uh, in December of 2013. Uh, the bureau. CFPB said that discriminatory pricing differences resulted from Ally giving dealers the ability and incentive to mark up interest rates and that this pricing and compensation structure injured more than 235,000 minority borrowers. But remember, the 235,000 was a guess. So now 16 months months later, the number of victims who have been identified and paid, what do you think? Zero. Okay. Okay. Nada, bupkis. Ally put the money in the escrow Usaid. account. The bank put the money in the escrow, escrow. account. They've done their job. Okay. Okay. The CFPB won't say how it arrived at the two hundred thirty-five thousand people, other than it used a statistical method known as, and if you know this, Jim, I'm very impressed. Statistical method known as the Bayesian Improved Surname Geocoding. <laughs> okay. Did uh, you know what that was? Well, I took the I took two statistics courses. Yes. That one does not ring a bell. That's why I'm asking you because you just went through now, the college lady courses who on me probably knows about stats. It. Yeah, okay. yeah, she has a PhD. She probably knows of it. But uh, no, it's possible the feds counted only people that they think are highly likely to be minorities. But people familiar with their process says the bureau doesn't like that approach because the victim totals are too low. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, now, what they do here, this is, I think this is fascinating. She, uh, this economist, uh, she tells us that if Bureau used its current methodology in a 2013 Ally case, fractions of borrowers would be added together to generate the total. In other words, if two borrowers each have a 50% chance of being black, they would count as one black borrower. In huh. reality, both oh. could be white, black, Asian, or members of any other racial category. That's where the half-victim things comes in. Yeah. yeah, but at the CFPB, two fractions can add up to one victim. That's like a Jewish guy. He has two Jewish daughters who are half-Jewish, so they go to a restricted <laughs> club, but they're both allowed to go into the pool up to their waist. There you go. <laughs> That's a Old good analogy. Groucho Marx line. That's a good analogy. Um, so, anyway, so how do you distribute money to fractions of victims? Well, I guess you figure out what you would give them if they were a whole victim, and then I don't just know. break. You know, no. The, the CFPB tells us that payments. This is their spokesperson. Payments yeah. cannot be sent until all affected consumers have been given a full opportunity to participate in the settlement, which requires extensive preparation and outreach. Huh. Well, you know, you're in a lot. If you bought something, like I got something from Barnes and Noble and Apple, I think it was something to do with price fixing on the eBooks. Right. And you get the statement in the mail that says, you know, if you want to participate in this lawsuit, you know, you don't have to do anything. If you want to opt out, you got to send some yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'm a little in. wary of those because I've also heard of rip-off things. That yeah. Were yeah. The cons. ones that you get and say, well, you don't have to, you don't have to do anything if you want to participate. Yeah. Those are, you know, okay, I don't have to do anything. Okay. I'm good with that. But that's what they'd be doing is sending this. They'd have to go through research, everybody, and then, okay, Jim, they decided you were half uh, black and I was half black. Okay. The 50% chance. Yeah. And, but they don't know for sure if we are or not. And they send us out something in the mail that says, do you identify with, are you black? Are you minority? Yeah. Did you uh, get an auto loan from Ally Bank? I, no, just what you just said. Yeah. I would be leery of answering that yeah. question because Very what leery. is this? Yeah, what what is this? This came from the CFPB. Who's that? I don't know. You Never know, a lot them. of people probably don't know who they are. Yeah, I mean, we just had that case in town of that lady who was ripped off by yeah. those guys yeah. from uh, Jamaica, and you know, with stories like that going exactly. around, you get yeah. a little leery uh, when p- things come in the mail like that. You go, hmm. You know. Yeah, yeah. So. You know how to you know how do you solve something like this? Well, I guess it's very maybe, carefully. Maybe make sure that you actually have victims. How right? does it work if you're Asian? Because Asians are technically a minority, but 
Asians, the stereotype of Asians is that they're good with money, right? Well, they're, they're good investors, they're smart, they're frugal they're, people. You yeah, know. Yeah, they're, they're very frugal. savvy with yeah. money. Yeah. yeah so will that work to your advantage if your name is Ling Chow? I don't. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Good question. So, I, I don't know. Interesting. Uh, you know, so if you get something like that in the mail, folks, think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Very carefully. But you might get some money from Ally Bank if you got an auto loan there. Yeah. Know. Right. Well, you know, okay. my dad was part of one of those trust things from the asbestos companies. Oh, okay. Because he was a bricklayer and he did a lot of concrete work and worked around asbestos and mm-hmm. he had some issues. Uh, not mesothelioma, thank God, yeah. but uh, some of the lesser afflictions yeah. and he got some money out of it. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll be back on the Dakota Housing Network. Dave Floor, Jim Walsh. Time keeps on Right now it's 64. Get the traffic and weather information you need anytime on Super Talk 1270 and online at supertalk1270.com. Oh, this is one of my favorites. Oh, it's a good one. Yep. Yeah. And rather, rather apropos from our last segment, indeed. talking about the uh, government and taking the money and running, I uh, think, yeah. the way it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back on the Dakota Housing Network, Dave Floor, Mr. Housing, here with Jim Walsh on the board. It's just the two of us, as Bill Weathers would say. Jim, George Lucas, you know George Lucas? Yeah, the movie Star guy. Star Wars. Star Wars. Indiana Jones. Chewie, we're home. Yeah. And he's, no, new Star Wars movie coming out this year. New Star Wars movie. Not George Lucas, so he sold it over to Disney. Yeah. And the guy directing is the guy who, uh, J.J. Abrams. J.J., yeah. Did Lost. On TV, the he did Star the first Trek reboot of the Star Trek, the which new, was a pretty good Star movie. Trek. It was a good movie, very good movie. Uh, very, you know, I think everybody's really anticipating what he's going to do with these. movies. One of our last chances it's to just see Leonard. Have you seen yeah. the trailers for? It? Uh, yes, Star- I have. It's, it's just it's kind of exciting. Apparently, they got the old gang together. They got yeah, uh, the, the, they got Luke is coming back. Uh, Carrie uh, Carrie Fisher Carrie and Fisher's Harrison coming Ford. back. Uh, Harrison Ford and Chewie and Chewie. Yeah. Yeah. The guy, they got the original guy who was Chewie yeah. in the costume. Yeah. yeah, they got him coming back. So I, I'm excited. I mean, I'm a Star Wars guy. I, I, you know, even the first, the, the first, the prequel movie, yeah. or whatever. I still, which nobody, everybody, everybody kinda panned, went, but yeah. hey, I kind of like them. I, it's Star Wars, man. So anyway, George Lucas. I, the reason I bring it up is George. George wants to build an affordable housing project in California. An affordable housing project. Yes. I think he's trying to stick it to his neighbors, though. Oh. Do um, you think he's just doing it for that reason? After George Lucas ran into a buzz, this comes from uh, well, CBS News. Uh, after George Lucas ran into a buzz saw of opposition from his wealthy Marin County neighbors when he tried to expand his Skywalker Ranch studio, the filmmaker might be getting some payback with plans for one of the largest affordable housing projects in the Bay Area. Uh, Lucas is offering to s- his own property in West Marin County off Lucas Valley Road uh, with to for the project with plans for a community of 224 homes right where neighbors said no to a studio expansion. George says, we, we've got enough millionaires here. What we need is some houses for regular working people. Lucas says he will pay for the project himself. And George says, if I'm not going to do what I wanted to do there to begin with, what can I do that would be really beneficial to the community? He's going to build some affordable housing. Oh, good for him, I good guess. Good for George, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, works sounds, out. it sounds like he's just kind of, he wanted to build a bigger studio and he's kind of yeah. just going to stick it to his neighbors a little bit too. And, yeah, that sounds like it. He's yeah. going to do something beneficial, but at the same time, kind of put his neighbors in his, in their place. Doing well by doing good. I wonder if Some, he's the richest guy in his neighborhood. You that's think? a good question. I'm sure he's up there. He, he's got to be up there, but I wouldn't count on him being Unless the he lives guy. with some of those Silicon Valley guys. Well, it's. Some of know, those guys are raking it in. Yeah, it's just. San Francisco area, so he's not necessarily the richest guy. Well, it's the most expensive city in the country to live in. Yeah. And I imagine the surrounding area, some of those gated communities, I imagine. uh, Yeah. Now, compare this, Jim. This comes from, we actually talked a little bit about this last week, the 19 signs that American families are being economically destroyed. This is a Mm. compare and contrast to George Lucas and his neighbors. And this also might win you a bar bet. Is this like a conservative thing where they're trying to show us how the American family is or being destroyed, being wiped out by the government? Yep. Okay. If you have no debt at all, and you also have ten dollars in your wallet, you are wealthier than what percent of all Americans? If you have no debt, and you have ten dollars in your wallet, hmm. 
you're wealthier than what percent of all Americans? What do you think? Well, technically, you're uh, ten dollars in the black. So uh, yeah. most people are m- m- the vast majority of people in this country are in the red. So I'd say it's a pretty high figure. I'm going to say seventy uh, percent. No, oh, you're you're way too uh, pessimistic. I think twenty five percent. Oh, okay. So if you had no well, debt at all, good. it's not bad. If you have no debt compared to what you thought it would be. If you have no debt at all and you have ten dollars in your wallet, you're yeah. wealthier than twenty five percent of all Americans. I mean, it's when uh, everybody is up to their ears in debt that you start having trouble with the economy. Exactly. Yeah. Um, no. On top of everything else, the average American must work from January first to April twenty fourth just to pay all federal, state, and local taxes. Oh, I've heard that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, that's a long time. That's like four months. It used to be like mid April, and uh, I think it's moved on. Far back as I remember, it's always been sometime in April. It's yeah. It's yeah. moved on so April 24th. We just got done last Thursday, a week from yes, from today. Last week, we paid. Yeah. We well, paid today's you. the end of we, April. We, if didn't, still, yeah. we didn't celebrate. We should have celebrated last oh. Thursday. Shoot. Or no, that was Friday, last Friday. Well, there was, a, uh, some people do a thing called Economic Independence Day. Yeah. Maybe that was last yeah. Friday then. I remember that. Vaguely. Okay. All right. No, um, nobody bought me a cake. No, I didn't get one either. Oh. Oh, well. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's talk about some home ownership stuff here. Um, homeowner value perceptions don't mess with appraisal realities. So people think their house is worth more than what an appraiser does. That probably is not surprising. Oh, no, does that surprise not surprising you? at all. Yeah. But it's not so bad. Uh, this is uh, coming from, uh, boy, we talk about Quicken and Loans here uh, today. But uh, Quicken and Loans had this report out. On a national scale, appraiser opinions are point four. 40% lower than homeowner estimates. Um, and that was home values had declined in March. Um, so really, people aren't that far off from what they think, what an appraiser would put a value on their house. So I, I think that's probably due to a little more information out there. Mm-hmm. But I think in general, you know, people, if you're going to list your house for sale, you probably think it's worth more than what it actually is. Well, I think everybody does. It's that's human normal. nature. It's uh, yeah. wishful thinking, too. And that's it, it part was, of human nature. Sure, absolutely. Um, now, Jim, oh, big news this week. Um, home ownership rate falls to its lowest level since 1993. Wow. Uh, big number. Home ownership years, rate yeah. of 63.7% was 1.1% lower than the first quarter of 2014. And it was a 0.3 percentage point drop from the fourth quarter of 2014. Uh, the home ownership rate, uh, it's an important lagging indicator of demand. Uh, says an economist at realtor.com. Hmm. Um, and it goes on to say, this is back to, you know, the quarter one, 1993 levels. And actually 63.7 was the low point for 1993. Now, I wonder why, is that an outgrowth of the bad economy from a couple of years? Back? Yes. You know, yeah. it's, it's certainly an effect on, you know, and, and this is a national scale and North Dakota's homeownership rate is higher than that. Oh, obviously. Yeah. Um, but nationally, it, it's an effect of, you know, people had their homes foreclosed on, so no, they're renting. Uh, you have yeah. a f- fact that, you know, credit standards, and these are all arguments that have been made for why the home ownership rate is dropping, is credit standards have tightened up so people can't qualify for loans as yeah. easily. Uh, you have people that, you have young people that have a lot of student debts, so they don't feel like they want to take on owning a home today. Yeah. Um, so that all factors in. And then home prices have gone up generally across the country from oh, their yeah. lows. Certainly around here they and have. around here in, oh, in yeah. a lot of areas across the country. So there's there's several factors that are affecting that home ownership rate. And the question is, you know, and they're asking here, uh, you know, at this level, we're, uh, the economist here goes on to say, we're essentially slightly lower than the average rate in the 1970s and 80s. So we're actually lower than it was in the 70s and 80s. Okay. Uh, you have to go all the way back to the 1960s to see a lower rate that stuck over a period of time. Hmm. So we're essentially back to pre 1970s on our home ownership rate in this country. Yeah. Now I don't know if that's you know 63, 64 percent. Is that okay? I don't. I don't really know if that is or not. Um, uh, they go on to say we you know we've gone from a demand problem and a supply surplus to having solid demand and a dearth of supply. Okay, we just we just mentioned that that yeah. that's an issue. Um, no, they go on. Uh, Goldman Sachs uh, they projected home ownership rate to drop further over the next two years, bottoming at sixty three point five in two thousand sixteen. Yeah, uh, but then 
Uh, you've got another economist uh, that says the home ownership rate fell further at the start of the year to a 22-year low of 63.7. However, with credit conditions now loosening and employment set to continue growing strongly, we suspect this long downward trend may not last much longer. So you got two conflicting um, economists, which is kind yeah, of normal. That's the old joke. You have 10 economists in a room and you have 11 opinions. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, it, it, but it, we've, we've fallen to the depths <laughs> we of the pre-1970s on the home ownership rate. Will we recover? Abyss. Will we recover? Will we, pull, will, will we get a lifeline? Will somebody pull us out? I don't know. And Will I don't we know if, recover, Bat fans? Yeah. Stay tuned. Yeah, do we need to be recovered from this? Maybe this is the new normal, and is that okay? Oh, there is a school of thought that any time you have what we euphemistically call an adjustment, what everybody else calls a recession mm -hmm. or a depression, sometimes it's exactly what the government needs to uh, get itself back in order. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're the market's correcting itself. Yeah, and will it come back? The unfortunate thing is, a lot of in the process, a lot of people lose their jobs. A lot of people get hurt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it it's an interesting thing, and and I think you know the housing, owning a home, uh, home buying is certainly an indicator of a, a healthy economy. Yeah. Um, so I think you know you, you we have this big group of people, the millennials. Mm -hmm. They're actually bigger than than the, the baby boomers. Yeah, bigger were, than which, we were. Yeah, than we were. Although um, not fatter than we were. Not fatter. Not yet. Anyway. No. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're a huge segment of the population. So we'll see over the next decade, will they start buying homes as they pay off their student debt yeah. and get, you know, the job market improves, et cetera. That'll, that'll be an interesting dynamic that we have and see what happens. Yeah. So anyway, we'll go out uh, oh, a little jungle love. Yeah. From Mr. Steve Miller, we will be back on the Dakota housing network. If you have, uh, any questions you'd like to ask, 663-1270. Currently 66 degrees. Your news leader, weeknights at 6 and 10. Super Talk 1270. Ah, here we go, the early stuff. Oh, Jim's mining the vaults here yeah. for the Dakota Housing Network. Space Cowboy. So he had two different versions of this song. Well, he had the Joker uh, on which he mentioned the, the Space, yeah, the space Cowboy. Cowboy. That's right. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, so the song was the Joker. He talks about, I'm right. the Space Cowboy. I'm the Gangster of Love. I'm the Gangster of Love, yes. Okay. So this is the actual Space Cowboy song. Did you ever hear any of the stuff he did with Boss Gags? No. Not bad. Not okay. bad? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll have to look for that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. We're back on the Dakota Housing Network. Dave Floor and Jim Walsh on the board. Um, Jim, you know, you know who Elon, is it Elon Tesla? He's got the car, the electric car. Oh, a Tesla, sure. He's he's one of the rich dudes. It's probably George Lucas's neighbor. Right. Yeah. Um, he was one of the guys probably complaining about the uh, maybe. I don't know. Studio. I don't. I don't have no idea where Mister Tesla lives. But he has Tesla Motors. Um, he's uh, got his electric car, which is really a cool looking car. But I think it's the one where the battery started on fire. Oh no. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I think they got that problem fixed, and he he does sell a very cool car. But now. You could get a Tesla home battery that would power your whole house. Ah. So, no, uh, the company uh, b plans to begin selling a battery that can be used to power a home. Uh, they'll be announcing it uh, in the next few days, if they haven't already, actually. Um, Tesla has been briefing environmental groups and analysts on its plans. Uh, what they're saying here is uh, storing electricity efficiently and expensively inexpensively and safely is a problem that has vexed the power industry since electricity was first harnessed. Mm. And we, we know that from North Dakota. We have our wind turbines. You know, how do you store the energy uh, generated by them? Um, but a storage uh, facility has huge implications for bolstering the national electricity grid and reducing pollution from power generation, which is, would all be good. Uh, homeowners and businesses, for example, could charge batteries at night when there is surplus generation and rates are cheap and then use the power during the day when there is a heavy load on the grid and rates are high. So basically, during the day, you could use that battery to run your air conditioner or your furnace or whatever um, when everybody else is using the regular grid. Um, now, what, did, what we don't know yet is how much the battery will cost. Uh, there are suggestions that, you know, could the home battery be leased or rented in a fa similar fashion to how other alternative energy sources are currently paid for, such as solar panels on homes. Um, 
recent study on solar power um, for residential showed that there is a demand from home buyers for solar powered homes, but you have an issue with the solar panels themselves. Do you purchase them or do you lease them? And then how does that affect future sales and stuff if you're leasing them? So there's some issues there. Um, but when uh, Mr. Uh, Musk announces the home battery, uh, as mortgage lenders and appraisers, we might have a whole new alternative energy issue to concern ourselves with as we go forward. So look for the Tesla home battery, Jim. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, okay, we talked about millennials earlier and how they're they're going to be the savior of the uh, home ownership rate in America. That makes sense. They're the young people, right? What are millennials? You're like, what, 25 to 34, I think? Something like that. Yeah. Something like that? Okay. But, you know, here's a problem. Uh, article says here that, hey, millennials, you know nothing about housing finance. And why are you completely okay with that? Uh, this comes from Housing Wire, uh, Brenna Swanson. 42% of home buyers say they are not at all concerned about having a lack of understanding about the mortgage process. Now, that's a pretty substantial number for one of the biggest financial decisions you're going to make. Uh, but 42% of people, they are completely fine with their ignorance, Jim. How about that? Um, I I don't like, well, I am ignorant, but I don't like to be ignorant about things. Okay, no, me neither. Yeah. Um, well, how ignorant are they is the question. Well, when they were put to a test, just one in four buyers correctly answered a series of questions about home buying, including how annual percentage rates work, which, you know, a lot of people, I can understand why they wouldn't figure out an APR. Uh, down payments and lenders. Down payments is important. Lenders, also important. Um. A recent Chase, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase survey sampled 1,000 uh, Americans with a qualifying age of 25 to 65 and who intended to buy a home within the next, next 18 months. Um, and that, that's where these numbers come from. Um, according to housing's top economist, 2015 is the year of the millennial. How about that, Jim? All right, the story about millennials not forming households and getting into home buying is more of a 2012-2013 early story, uh, according to Realtor.com. It's outdated, so there's realtors are saying this is outdated. Um, but I, I don't know if that's a good idea that people are ignorant. There's lots of opportunities to educate yourself. Um, and you sh- there are online classes you can take, uh, housing finance agency where I work. We have an online home buyer education course. So there's a lot of opportunities. And I think you know when you do a survey and somebody doesn't know today anything about these topics, doesn't mean they can't get educated very quickly about them. Um, and when they actually are looking to buy a home, they're probably going to find some of this stuff out and understand it. Oh, so, yeah. You know, don't, don't panic that you know people are going to go into this totally blind. I hope most people would not. <laughs> So some, would. some people would. Some would. But the opportunities are out there to learn. There's all kinds of information. Um, now, other things the Chase survey found, um, across, this is across all adult age brackets, uh, m- more than one-third of potential homeowners are not very or not at all aware of closing costs. So you're talking about appraisals, uh, title insurance, uh, it, you know, et cetera, um, that you got to pay for, for closing costs. Um, now, Home buyers today are motivated to jump into the housing market because of the rising rental costs we talked about and historically low interest rates, which we talk about every week here. Um, the survey found that 32% want to buy soon in order to take advantage of low rates. Uh, 35% say that 30-year fixed rates rising above 4% would delay their decision to buy. Now, on a perspective basis, 4% interest rate is very low on a historical, on a historical basis. It's still a, a fantastic rate, okay? Okay. It, 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 as we opened the show with, the Freddie Mac survey, a year ago at this time, the 30-year rate was over 4%. It was over, like four and a quarter. Is there a bottom, uh, uh, theoretically, to how low the interest rate realistically can be? Well, I hope it's zero. Well, yeah. I mean, like they <laughs> but, say that uh, the ideal, you know, the perfect employment rate is 4%. Because yeah. Because there's always certain people in transit between jobs. Right. I, you know, I think for mortgage rates... Uh, you know, I just think how how is anybody going to give you a loan to buy a house for fifteen years, twenty years, or thirty years? Give you a loan and anticipate that I will not earn any interest on that, giving you that loan for the yeah. next thirty years. Probably not going to happen. So yeah. I think there's a floor out there. There's a bottom to what someone would 
if rates got down to where somebody would say, I'm going to go look for something else because I've not given this person my money for 30 years and get nothing out of it. Oh, no. I want a chance to get something. Yeah. You know, I'll give you, I might give you a loan at 1% for a couple of years because yeah. I don't think rates are going to go any higher. That's why I say there's no years. such thing as getting a loan for no, 0% unless you're right. borrowing from family or something. Right, exactly. If so, you're borrowing from a bank, that's how they stay in business. Yeah, so you know, theoretically, you know, it's zero probably, or, you know, yeah. it could be less. I guess you could pay to have somebody keep your money for you, but uh, which actually has happened in Europe, yeah, in Greece and that, but. I think with mortgages, I, it'd be pretty tough for anybody to give you a, a regular mortgage, a 15, 20, or 30-year mortgage. It's probably not going to happen. They're going to well, want to get something for it. If you're paying somebody to hold your money for you, isn't that de facto interest? Y- yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's the definition. Reversed. It's reversed. You're paying money to have yeah. somebody take care of your money. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, let's see. Insights from the mind of the home buyer. This was on millennials, and this is, continues the Chase survey here. Rising rent and low interest rates, getting buyers off the sidelines. 32% say they want to buy soon to take advantage of low rates. 35% say, as we said, 30-year mortgage above 4% would delay buying. Okay. 20% say the number one reason to buy is rising cost of rent and desire to upgrade from their current home. Uh, Home buying misperceptions. 42%, as we said, not concerned with completely, about not completely understanding the mortgage process. Um... Affordability and competition, the biggest concern about the housing market. 70% of prospective buyers worry they missed the chance to buy due to rising prices. 56% of potential buyers concerned about finding a home that fits within their budget and is located in a quality neighborhood. So we talked about that earlier today too, the you know the rising cost of home. Why is the home ownership rate dropping? All these factors are playing in here. Uh, relationships, gender and buyer's anxiety. Oh, Jim, men and women differ on how important it is to stick to their budget. Okay. 49% of women are more conservative than their partner and don't want to go beyond budget. 39% of men are less conservative than partner and willing to push their budget limit. One third of couples bicker when home buying. So, Jim, are you more conservative in your household or is your wife? Uh, Of the two of us, it's hard to say. Right now I'd say my wife is because she doesn't want to do anything with the money right now. Yeah. Okay, I'm I'm the conservative one. My wife, and that's understandable because we're going through a lot right now with school and uh, yeah. her surgery. And yeah, yeah. No, my wife says I'm just plain old cheap. Okay. Although I think I spent too much money, so yeah. I apparently, yeah, I'm I am cheap because if well, she thinks I'm cheap, <laughs> and I think I don't, I spend too much money, then I must really be bad. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> so I don't know. You know what do you do? But it, you know, you both have to be comfortable with buying a home, et cetera. So. Right. All right. Uh, next week on Dakota Housing Network, uh, Greg Larson should be in, and we'll uh, yeah. see what happens next week with Greg. I think he's got a couple guests lined up. So, And we're going out. Steve Miller on The Joker. Yeah. All right. See you, folks, next ABC News, Super Talk 1270. Accurate news, stimulating talk. This is KLXX AM, Mandan Bismarck.